Valley, thanks so much for joining North Valley Online. If you are new with us, you can text NV Connect to 94090. Let us know. We would love to reach out to you. Also, if you've been tuning in the last few weeks, watching online, maybe you've made a decision to follow Christ, you want to get baptized, you want to get plugged in, serve on one of our ministry teams, or we just need prayer and encouragement throughout the week. At any time, you guys can text NV Connect to 94090. We'll have a pastor follow up with you throughout the week. Later on in the service, we're going to be partaking in communion together at home so you guys can grab some bread, crackers, some juice. That will be at the end of the message. But right now, we're going to continue on with worship as our band leads us in a song called Something Good. Romans 8, 28, it says, For we know that in all things God works together for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So let's reflect on those lyrics. Let's declare these truths from wherever you're tuning in. North Valley, let's worship. This water, I won't go on, I won't drown. When I'm in over my head, I know that you won't let me down. When I'm broken and down to nothing, I know that you are always up to something.
Hey, North Valley, so glad that you have joined us online today. Uh, We are excited to be moving on site. Make sure you check your emails in the coming uh, days ahead about a special announcement about regathering on campus. So miss you guys tremendously and look forward for to rejoining together. It's been a long, long time. Well, today we're jumping back into a message series called Better Together. And today what I want to do is look at an incredibly famous passage in the Bible, Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Uh, We're going to be looking at that, perhaps the longest in the greatest uh, section of Scripture that gives us a vision for what God thinks about government. So in a time when there's a lot of upheaval and question and suspicion against our government, uh, I want us to take a look at what God's Word has to say. So kind of before we get started, though, I want to tell you, you ever had a bad idea before? There's a lot of bad ideas when it comes to Christian thought with government. I can remember a bad idea for me as a teenager growing up. Uh, My buddy and I went out on a four-by-four adventure. We came up to a creek that turned into a raging river. It was a massive rainstorm, much like what we see in Arizona when you get those big rains and monsoons. All the, all the brave and the courageous think they're going to punch the Prius through those washes. And then we all watch on TV these guys getting uh, washed downstream, choppers come out, cameras come on, and everybody says, that was dumb. Well, that's exactly what my friend and I did. We were sitting there beside the, this river that's raging. We're four by four tough. We're teenagers strong, and we think we can do it. Remember, he slaps the dash on the Chevy and says, the heavy Chevy can make it through anything. Famous last words of a redneck. And so this is what we do. We, we push it. We go through that river, and sure enough, we're bobbing down the river, bouncing off of boulders, and thank goodness, we could swim even in the currents. And so the point is, is we all come to this place when it comes to decisions and thinking where we just get some bad ideas. I want to tell you about three bad ideas that if you jump into these ideas, you are jumping into what I would call dangerous waters, dangerous rivers of thinking when it comes to Christian thought on government. The first one is this idea This bad idea is that government should require religion. This is a bad idea for so many reasons. And I know uh, for many of you, you would say, that's not my idea. But it is an idea of many Christians, perhaps in the fundamentalist camps, that would say all government should require, we should make a Christian nation, legislate it, pass it, mandate it, state-sponsored religion. Well, first of all, I just wanted to point out a problem with this dangerous idea of thinking so that you don't drown in these currents and jump into that thinking or ideology. Um, First of all, forcing anyone to faith is against very plain Bible teaching. There are many people who've pressured others uh, into making decisions for Christ, eager preachers or or, uh, wanting wives for their husbands to come to faith in Christ, or culture putting pressure on people to look very Christian. And what it does is it creates a phony kind of Christian, a cultural kind of Christian that's not genuine. And forcing people to faith is against Jesus's teaching. I think of Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, when Jesus says he offers an invitation and he says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I'll give you rest. There's very much a uh, faith is something that's uh, 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 chosen. It's something that is, is free and open for all. Secondly, Jesus affirmed this idea of keeping ab- uh, religion and the state uh, government separate. He creates these kind of two spheres, if you will. In Matthew twenty two eighteen, 18, we learn about a religious group of leaders that are trying to trap Jesus into this controversial question uh, when it comes to taxes, and so he, they pose this question to Jesus, and they say, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? And then Jesus is aware of their malice, and he begins to, uh, uh, he says, show me a coin. He grabs the coin. They look, and he says, whose inscription on it? They say, it's Caesar's. And then he says the famous words that we perhaps remember, render under Caesar's what is Caesar's, and render under God's what is God's. And in doing so, what he's doing is he's affirming two spheres, 
a separation between what we call in, in our country, separation between church and states. He's acknowledging there are two spheres and as a believer, you've got to operate within those two spheres. Render under Caesar's what is Caesar's. We need to pave roads. We need to pay taxes. We need to have a, a civilization, a government. That's part of it. And then you need to render under God's what is God's. That means there's another sphere. We should give, contribute to our places of worship so that ministry and, and places of worship can gather and, uh, and fulfill their faith practices. So in this dangerous ideology that government should be forced, it's a terrible idea to do this. There, there have been many faith groups and still are. Uh, perhaps in, in Islam, uh, there's a greater sense of forcing conversions, um, but there's these uh, many faith groups that force faith on others, and God's Word doesn't advocate that idea at all. Uh, government should not force anyone to faith, and in fact, this was written into our Constitution. Uh, in our First Amendment is regarding religion and expression, Congress shall make no law respecting any establishment of re religion or prohibiting the free exercise uh, thereof. So the idea that we force religion is a very, very dangerous river to jump in. The second one I would caution you uh, to not jump into is this idea that all government is evil. Um, Bible speaks very different of an evil uh, government, um, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time here because I really don't think this, this idea holds a lot of weight, but I'll tell you some of the, the beginnings of this uh, ideology. It's come out of Christianity thinking. Some have looked to Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 12, um, when Satan tempts Jesus before his earthly ministry and in a sense says, hey, um, you're hungry. He's been fasting for 40 days. I, I can do anything you want. I can turn uh, these stones into bread and feed you. He identified to his temptation of pleasure and natural want. Then Jesus says, no, you should not test the Lord your God. Then Satan goes to him and says, you know what? He took him up on a high place and says, I can give you every kingdom authority and power. I have that control to do that. Well, so people have thought over the years in, in Christian circles, bad idea, that actually Satan is control of all government. Because when Satan says that, it's indicating, if you read this, go back and read the passage, it indicates that he has the divine authority, the supernatural authority to control all government, all authorities, and all power. So what, what should we think about that? You got to remember what Jesus said about Satan. He said, he's the liar. The devil is a liar. He's the father of lies. The devil is lying to Jesus and trying to perhaps persuade his humanity, dismissing his full divinity, and trying to trick him into believing that. When the Bible says actually very different that the devil is not in control of all government and all government is not evil, for in Job 12, 23, it says that he causes nations to rise and fall, meaning God. God has the power to raise up a nation and then uh, let a nation fall. It says that he changes times and seasons and removes kings and then sets up kings in Daniel. God holds all authority. The devil is limited and, and he is on a leash like a rabid dog to try to uh, 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 mess up all and corrupt all that is in our government. But yet there is this reality that God has all authority. The Bible says as well this concept about um, the power of authority. When we read in Daniel, it says that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives wisdom to whom he will. And in Romans, we read as well that there's no authority other than that authority that has been established or instituted by God. So Satan wants people to believe that he controls our government. Uh, Satan wants us to believe that all government is evil. Um, but the idea is, is that if we jump into this dangerous river of thinking and say all government is evil, forget about it, then in a sense we're handing over the keys to the, uh, to the kingdom of darkness and allowing that to run and to rule. When God's word is said, no, not at all, he has established government for his good and for uh, uh, for our good in his glory. Dangerous river number three, I would call, is this idea where Christians say, as a Christian, you need to share the gospel. Don't talk about politics. Uh, I call this kind of car seat Christianity. 
Uh, I'm a dad. I love my kids. And each one of my kids, when they get in the car, when they were little, I put them in the car seat. Do they want out of the car seat? Oh, yeah. I mean, they did the scorpion back move when I would try to clip them in at times. They hated the car seat. And they always wanted to ride on the side of the seat. And then finally, when they got a little bigger, they got out of the car seat and they got into the booster. And then when they're really bigger, they get to ride up front. Well, in our culture, there's a lot of Christians that would say, you need to stay in your car seat. You can't get out of that. Don't talk. You have a a different way of thinking. Stick to the Bible. Stick to Jesus. Don't talk about these bigger issues. In a sense, they're saying, stay there. You need to be restrained. Contain yourself. This is not your sphere. You're not a big boy yet. And the Bible actually says something very, very different. Um, We are called as Christians uh, to engage politics. Now, I will be be honest with you. As a lead pastor, founding pastor of North Valley Community Church, I tend to try to stay away from a lot of political issues as a preacher. Do I have the right and the authority to talk about political issues from a positional level as a pastor? Yes, I do. Do I have the right and the privilege and the opportunity to uh, encourage our congregation uh, to vote for a certain candidate as a positional efficient? I do not. And honestly, I stay out of those positions most of the times because I think that there's a growing number of people in our country that are frustrated with the political tensions and there's so much objections and suspicion about Christian agendas and political movements that it can short side the conversation, shut it down, and I don't get the chance to share Jesus and the Bible with people if I always talk about politics. So this series that you're hearing is a little bit different but it's, it is very important, and it holds true to the engagement, I think, that we ought to have as Christians to engage political issues with a biblical Christian worldview, and we've got to seek to uphold the Bible and the truth in what I call all areas of life. This all areas of life mentality is very clear in Scripture. It's the idea of understanding that God created you in His image and we're, as, we as Christians need to be stewards of who he made us. And we want, uh, most of us as Christians, we want to apply God's word when it comes to our marriage. We want to apply God's word uh, when it comes to our, 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 our engagement with the church. But when it comes to politics, we try to grab car seats and throw people in them. You know, do you know something? Those are three institutions I just mentioned that God created. The only three institutions, by the way, that he created for earth. He created the institution of marriage. He created the institution of, of government, we find in the very beginning in Genesis, uh, and then reaffirmed in the New Testament. And then he also affirmed and instituted the government of the church. And what we do oftentimes in this ideology of, hey, share Jesus, but not politics, car seat Christianity. What we're doing is saying, well, Christians only have the right to talk about two-thirds of the institutions that God has created. They don't have the right to talk about the the other third. And I would disagree. I think that we need to have an all-of-life mentality that God created the whole world and all that is in it, even the government, that institution, and Christians ought to engage in those issues but to do so with a biblical Christian worldview. So what's the, what's the Bible got to say about government? Um, I'll tell you, you know, when the terrible news of, of George Floyd, the killing hit the news, it, I, I watched that and I was, I was sad. I, I was shocked. I was uh, frustrated, uh, like many of you perhaps, uh, and then realizing the magnitude of what was about to happen I had a feeling this was going to be different than anything else that we've ever seen. Why? We were tired as, a, as Americans and as people on all parts of the world of this pandemic that we've been going through. And then we see this, and the whole world feels like it's starting to spin out of control. Uh, shopping centers are given cur- curfews. Citizens have to go home. And it's added from frustration to frustration. And then this happens, and I knew it was going to be from hard times are even going to get worse. And we went from pandemics to protests to riots and racial tensions reaching an all-time high. And honestly, I wept for a period of time for our country and feeling the pressure of like, God, how do we navigate this as Christians? And I opened my Bible. I started to read. 
I reached out to all my black friends in the church. I reached out to all the police officers in the church, and I formed panels and discussions and opportunities and engagements and taught on biblical subjects and teaching on them even now. And I come to realize that, you know, while we have done a great deal of good in the church in North America is happening right now, most of my church friends are engaging racial conversations. Praise be to God, it needs to happen. We need to see reform. We need to see a stronger commitment to the Imago Day. We need to figure out how do you do justice within culture as Christians, and I'm gonna teach on that later. But we also need to remember the government issue. We also need to remember the men and women in uniforms. In fact, I invited many of those men and women in uniforms to join me on the stage, and all of them declined because the department said, no way, too controversial. They were afraid for, their, uh, for death threats, for uh, their harm and hurt that would come upon the, themselves, their department, and their family. This shouldn't be so. I think sometimes what we've done is we throw the baby out with the bathwater. When we see one sense of injustice, we try to categorize or demonize the whole thing. And we got to be careful in that. Um, I'm not denying that there's not in, injustice or corruption in any organization or in any institution. But we've got to look at what the Bible has to say about government. And specifically what I want to do is walk through Romans uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. You need to get your Bibles out because I'm going to have, walk through this and then kind of punch through um, some truths on it for you. But what I want to do is help paint the context real quick. Um, when the Apostle Paul is writing this, he's addressing Rome. Rome is the imperial capital city of the Roman Empire. Um, Nero was in office from 54 AD to 68 AD. Um, uh, Christians at this point in time are kind of seen as sub subversive, uh, kind of outcast, and there's a lot of Jewish people that had come to faith in Jesus Christ. They said, oh yeah, snap, Jesus is the Messiah. So they believe in him, and there's kind of this mass revival going on. And But many of the Jewish folks and Judeo-Christians are frustrated and tired of Rome. And they don't like the taxes. So nothing is new under the sun, you know. So they don't like the taxes and they're frustrated. And yet Nero is in power. Paul's going to write to these Christians that are in what we would see as and understand as house churches, kind of a behind the scenes uh, uh, church movement going on. And he's going to caution them from seeking to be rebel rousers. Um, Nero, mind you, has not instituted systematic persecution at this point in time. If he had so, most scholars agree that the Apostle Paul and Peter probably would have written perhaps with a different tone. But nonetheless, there was persecution um, for Christians. They, did, they weren't popular. They didn't attend the gladiator games. They didn't go to the nude theaters. They didn't participate in the pagan practices of Rome. So Paul talks to him, and he gives him instructions about how to view government from a godly perspective. And I think that is so timely for us today as Christians. So again, open your Bible, and, and let's look closely in this. Um, seven lessons about uh, uh, God in government. Um, well, let me just read the passage, and then we'll jump into that. So it says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. In other words, all that's in authority, God instituted it. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities, resist what God has appointed so if you're resisting authorities, you're resisting who God has placed into that authority position. And those who resist will incur judgment, of course. And if you're, if you're going to rebel and go against the government, Paul says, you're going to face judgment. There'll be consequences. Verse 3, for the rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. In other words, if you do bad, you should be afraid. He says, it clarifies, would you have no fear of the one who is in authority, uh, then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. And then continuing on, for because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing, 
So pay taxes to all, pay to all who is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, uh, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. And it seems just very clear that God speaks of the purpose and the role of government. And what I want to do is walk through kind of uh, seven timely truths for us about God in government. Number one, that God appointed the authorities who have governmental power. In other words, when we read the very plainness of scripture and it says, there is no authority except from God. I think of the instance when Pilate uh, pulls Jesus aside and he's about to hand him over to be crucified. And he kind of cautions him and he says, hey, Jesus, don't you know that I have power? I have power to put you to death in a sense. And Jesus says, you have no power that's been grant- that hasn't been granted to you by my Father above. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, you're here because God put you here. I'm here to fulfill my divine mission. If Jesus wasn't the Messiah, I don't think he would have pressed through uh, to the crucifixion. Jesus willingly, consistently went, into, went to the cross for the sake of uh, sinners to be reconciled with God, and he knew Pilate's role And the scripture tells us continually and consistently that there is no authority except that has been established or instituted. Those key words in your scripture in verse 1 and verse 2 is instituted. And then again, it says God has appointed those into these positions. Secondly, we see that civil rulers are a terror to bad conduct. Verse 3 says, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. In other words, if, if you do bad, you ought to be afraid. And that's very much the sense why we have police officers on our streets running their routes, because there's evil in our world. There's so much evil in our world because sin has infected, affected everything and everyone. Satan, while he does not control, have all authority over all that is in our world, he is at work in our world and is incredibly powerful and seeks to undermine all that is good and all that is godly. Number three, civil rulers give approval for what is good. So he says, do what is good and you'll receive his approval. What does that mean? Like, I mean, there's tax breaks. If you you, uh, are a married couple, you get tax breaks. If you have kids, there's tax breaks. Uh, uh, We are benefits of national parks. We benefit from the parks and the things that we go to. There's laws that are passed that help protect the dignity and humanity of life uh, against a abortion, and and many times they have, in many states there's not now, but there is a great deal of common good. Civil rulers are to approve what is good. Does this always happen? No, but this is what government is intended to do. Number four, government officials serve God. Even the non-Christians, you might say, even the the Islamic or or the Mormon or the uh, uh, Buddhist or, or whatever, you name it. Yes, if they, are, if they are serving for the good of people, they are, as a governmental leader, civil leader, they're, in a sense, carrying out what's been called God's common grace to all people. Government officials serve God. They're servants of God. Verse 4 and 6 tells us this. He says, they're God's servants for your good. And then again, for he, uh, this person is a servant of God, and they are even called ministers of God, which is mind-blowing. Government officials, police officers, politicians in authority are called ministers of God. And you're like, ah, not my minister. I get it. I understand what you're saying. However, Paul's using this language to speak to that when government is working in proper order, this is what they're doing. They're carrying out the common good for all mankind. And these are not Christians, mind you, in Rome. These are pagans. These are not, these are not pro-Christian people. Um, that Paul's talking about. Ver- number five, we see that there is this reality uh, that government officials are doing good as they carry out their work in saying that uh, uh, they are, they're doing good, they're contributing to the good. So therefore, when we see police officers, when we see politicians, we have to understand they're helping run things for the common good of all people. And God, God's I- the government is not man's idea, it was God's idea. Um, Even in heaven, we will see kingdoms, uh, those in authority, ruling and reigning. So uh, we didn't just get government because it's just, uh, oh, well, we got to do it because the world is so messed up. No, 
government is a godly concept uh, for civilizations, for humanity, and even, I believe, in eternal uh, dwelling for all people. When the, when the Bible talks about nations gathering, that's indication of countries and people and, and, and kings and rulers. So I think we could uh, accept that kind of understanding. Number six, government authorities execute God's wrath on wrongdoers. In verse four, it talks about being afraid of those uh, who bear the sword. And back then, it was at one time, uh, it was the axe that would behead the individual. They practiced capital punishment, and they were brutal at it, and they were there was all sorts of atrocities and, and, and corruption going on in Rome. But as a whole, the Apostle Paul is affirming these concepts that are instituted by God. Um, there was crucifixions, like you know, and these were brutal uh, leaders. And Rome became more and more corrupt and ends up uh, uh, persecuting systematically all Christians. And so um, at this point in time, though, that's not happening. And, and the Apostle Paul is talking about how when... Uh, Authorities in power are punishing crime and wrongdoers. It's actually uh, activating God's wrath, and it is a force of that. In bearing the sword today, we don't carry swords; we carry pistols. Uh, we we carry guns, and, and so there is this reality in Scripture that God affirms this. And so, our police officers, we ought to be praying for them. We ought to see them as doing good. They're helping. If somebody breaks into my house or my grandmother's house, and she calls 911 and no one's there, that's just not a good thing. We need officers in uniform, men and women, because the world is filled with evil. And there's all sorts of injustice. And yes, we should seek reform where we can, but we can't overthrow the whole concept and dismiss what the Bible says here. As, as well, in, there's an additional idea here, is that uh, number seven, that governing authorities and officials are owed honor and respect. And verse 7 says that we are to respect those uh, who are put into these positions that were to show honor where honor is owed. There's a consistent theme that it, God has placed government into a position, for, again, for the common good of all people. And, and it's this idea that God is using this for the good of all people, despite their, 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 their belief system. Um, but he's using it for good. So I would suggest that you keep your Bibles open. I suggest that you dig a little deeper into this concept. Uh, uh, I would suggest maybe even grab an additional resource that's tremendously helped me. Uh, Dr. Wayne Grudem has an excellent, gigantic book uh, called Politics According to the Bible. He wrote perhaps one of the greatest systematic theologies of all times, Outside of my Bible, his systematic theology, those are the two books. If I was stranded on an island, that's what I would grab. Um, his politics books is really good as well. And I think it's important for you to take a look more into this idea from a biblical perspective, a Christian worldview, how do you engage in politics? So that's what I want to talk to you about for just a moment. Um, how do Christians respond to politics? First, I would say we know some how, there's a lot of ideas on how to engage politics. But I see some people just go into war. And, and I get it. I, I, they're frustrated. They're mad. And so um, it's, it's scary times. If you post anything political, you have the chance of nobody wants to post on it. Nobody wants to share who they're, they, they're voting for or what they're because they're afraid of the war that they might get into online. But then there are some people that are just so brave, they're just going to war. And they feel like we are going to take America back. And they're quoting Bible verses like, if the people would just turn away from their sins, then God would heal our land. I don't think that's a great verse to quote. That was for the nation of Israel. It's not for the United States of America. Um, there's a warlike mentality that goes on where people are preparing for battle, marching in parades, they're in the picket lines, they're in the protests, they're fighting the system. They want to fight to get our country back uh, to moral majority. They want to elect candidates hoping to save our country. Christians are on all sides of this. And there's a war going on, a cultural war, a political war. And then this often leads to being frustrated, losing friends, and a, a, a complete despair of not seeing their dreams fully realized. 
There's another group though. There's another group uh, when how to really respond to politics that they just kind of, they put their guns in the ground. They surrender. They wave the white flag. They say, well, I just want peace. So they, they shut up. They get behind the scenes. They get in their car seat and they don't ask mom or dad to let them out. They give up from battle fatigue. They're tired of the tensions. They dodge the discussions. They avoid the issues. They shut down conversations. They turn off the TV. They dis- unplug from social media. They resign, they resign and they, buy, they bow out out of battle fatigue. And I get it. I've been there. And then there are those that, that just head for the hills. These are my favorites. These are fun. They head for the hills. They're getting ready for the end of the world. They buy generators. They build bunkers. They are reading up on their Bible in Revelation. They're running it through like crazy. They're even reading on how to form a militia or join a militia. They're, they're tart and starting to plan. They're grabbing their guns. They're grabbing their Bibles, and they're headed for the hills. I think it's important that we look at our Bible and we look at end times discussions. I'm going to teach on that later in the fall. But there's those that are just heading for the hills. They're tired of it. They're running. They're going. They're getting ready. And then there's some that go on mission. These are Christians that have taken up a new mission, not to win America to Christ, hear me on this, but to win Americans to Christ. There's a big difference in that. These are individuals that say, I'm not trying to win America to Jesus Christ. I'm gonna try to win Americans to Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to convert a country. I want to see God convert citizens of that country. And I think this is the mindset that we must take when it comes to politics. Now, are you bad for going into those others? No, not necessarily. Just be careful. Not everybody's called to do that. You need to think before you go do something. But every Christian, under my understanding of Scripture, needs to go on mission. Why is that? Well, just a couple big concepts to understand, and, and uh, then we'll move forward in this idea of going on mission in our culture. Um, and I don't mean in, in the sense of that we are all moving into uh, a professional ministry like a pastor or a missionary. I'm talking about going into the culture, being a Christian, and communicating, sharing, and showing the love of Christ in any sphere or influence that you have in whatever category that is. Christians that have said, I'm going to go on mission, I'm going to be in a sense a missionary, understand there's this reality, whether they know it knowingly or just kind of subconsciously, this is what's going on in American culture. Um, We have two different categories we need to remember. We have Christendom, which is the idea which America is kind of like a great case study where a country is founded on biblical principles and ideology. And then we've been running that for about 500 years. So, that's Christendom. Christendom is this kind of government, kind of church and state blur, Christian country, and God we trust, but who's God? Do most Christians really, I mean, they say, in God we trust, you know, but who's God? And Christendom is that. And then there is Christianity. Followers of Jesus Christ been going on for 2,000 plus years in every uh, 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 all around the globe, all around the world, world, people are love Jesus, follow Jesus, read their Bibles, serve in their churches, contribute financially in their churches, uh, live uh, accordingly to Scripture uh, with other uh, Christians, calling them brothers and sisters in Christ, seeking unity. That's been going on for thousands of years. Christendom is something we created. Christianity is something Jesus created. And so as a missionary, we stop fighting for Christendom and we fight stronger for our own faith protection to be able to preserve the right to be simply Christian. And if you were to do research in American culture today, while so many would say that they affiliate with a a, a God or Christianity, only about 8% would acknowledge that they love Jesus Christ as Lord They look to the Bible as their authority. They attend church, serve or contribute financially to their church. That's 8%. So here's where I'm challenging you to to accept this idea. Christendom is dead. It's been dead. 
So stop fighting for Christendom. Remember that we should live as Christians. We have a higher calling uh, for a kingdom that is not of this earth. And our greatest uh, hope is not in in a, a, a earthly king, but it's in an eternal king. And so there's this reality as Christians that we've got to stop fighting for what I would call cultural Christianity and just accept real Christianity. And the Bible told us about this, that we were going to face hard times. And so this tension that my unchurched friends feel, this frustration about this political agenda to try to uh, convert our country, to get our country to turn back to God and what we need is everybody to just have all Christian representatives in every power. I think there's value in that, but that's not the calling for every Christian to do that. And what we need more than anything is this uh, tenacious commitment to go into our culture to be representatives and ambassadors, not for an earthly kingdom, but an eternal kingdom. That's what we've got to do. We have got to go on to mission. So, biblical passages I challenge you to look at is 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12, when we're challenged to live as sojourners. The Christian today needs to take up and shoulder up the sojourner mentality. They've got to realize they're passing through, that they're foreigners in this land, that there is no uh, 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 ultimate allegiance to any country other than the ultimate allegiance to Jesus Christ and that country, and that citizenship. Now, does that mean that we should dismiss the earthly ones? Not at all. Remember Romans. Remember Genesis. We have to abide by those. We live by those. We thank God for those as it still enables us in so many ways in this country to have uh, the freedom of our expression in our place of worship. Because of government in, in North America, we have the freedom to preach and teach and gather as we please. I think it's a great thing. Forcing faith is a bad thing. You don't want to force people to do something that's, that's, not, that's not biblical. But we as Christians need to learn how to leave as sojourners. And the Apostle, Paul, uh, the Apostle Peter as well challenges us to live honorable among all unbelievers. So that means as Christians, we've got to learn how to live with a sense of honor and dignity despite the disagreement, despite the crazy tensions and the hostilities, you've got to live honorable. Additionally, We're challenged by the Apostle Paul in the Church of Rome. He writes to the Christians and says, hey, don't be conformed to the world, though. Be transformed. So we as Christians got to remember we can't conform to the world. The world and its earthly value systems are absolutely contrary to the eternal value systems, the eternal kingdom. And so we are not to be conform to the world, but be transformed through the renewal of our mind. That is God's word. That is the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Additionally, we have to remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, Father, when he prayed for Christians, for all generations, by the way, in John chapter 17, he, 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 he said, Father, thank you for giving me these believers. I pray that you don't take them out of the world, but that you keep them in the world and that you send them through the world like you did me. You and me, as Christians, we got to rem- remind ourselves we're sent people of God. We're joining Jesus' mission. We're helping set up a kingdom that's not yet, it's an invisible kingdom. A- a- and when we forget the kingdom, which kingdom we're really fighting for and really working towards, then we lose the battle already. And Jesus reminded the believers that they are in the world. So be careful when you head for the hills. We need people here. Um, And then remember as well that you're a witness to the world. The Bible says in Acts 1.8 that the church would receive power and that the Holy Spirit would come upon them and they would be witnesses. And it says to the ends of the earth. So what do we need? We need Christians uh, into every nation. In every sphere, all of life mentality. So what is the goal for the Christian when it comes to our country? The goal of the Christian isn't to win a country to Christ, but it's to win citizens to Jesus Christ. 
This doesn't mean that we shouldn't vote our values. This doesn't mean that we should stay out of politics and jump into the car seat Christianity. We don't need grown men and women sucking their thumbs, acting like babies. We need them to get engaged. But this does mean that we need to understand there's a difference in the calling. There are some, and I thank God for these people, uh, brave men and women that I would say have accepted a special calling to engage uh, reform and be major cultural shifters and makers. And I call these people the robes of society. These are those that wear the robes such as teachers or at local schools or graduations or pastors or preachers or priests in religious ceremonies or professors in the universities or politicians or judges or all those in men in uniform, men and women in uniform. And these Christians are the ones who have these special roles to go into the government and its sphere and into these cultural shape, uh, uh, shaping uh, uh, platforms, if you will, to help communicate to communities, to help uh, change laws, to help uh, bring about a common good for all people. These are, is a special calling, and it is a blurry line between church and state, and it's an added level of stress for so many, but it's an incredible responsibility to realize that when God calls you to that, you're a cultural influencer, and it shapes future generations to come. And so this is a role that will be the most criticized, the most persecuted in the coming days, in the coming years, in the coming generations. These roles will be. Because a teacher won't know how to navigate, be struggling to navigate their faith in light of the government. The police officers are going to feel the increased frustration, the Supreme Court justice. There's going to be an incredible challenge on this special calling. But for the majority of Christians, I want to tell you something. The majority of Christians, you do not have that calling. The calling that you have is good news is much simpler. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Jesus said, you know, in this world, what? You'd find trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world, meaning he's got a whole new world for you. You're a sojourner. You're sent into the world. He's building a whole new one for you. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. But for the majority of Christians, I would say it's a lot easier. Um, it's a life that God calls the Christian, in a sense, two things. Love God, love neighbor. Love God, love neighbor. Uh, work hard, love and lead the family. As the Apostle Paul once said, aspire to live, a, live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands. So I'm, what I, every Christian should seek to share and show the love of Jesus Christ in every platform that they have. Not all Christians are called into those other spheres. And so this, this should change the way we think about how to engage and how to respond to politics and, and the uh, tension that we face in our roles in relationship with government. It, it should be no surprise for every Christian to realize that we're being, and we will be, increasingly more persecuted. Uh, if it's verbal harassment, right now it is not popular to be Christian. It, you are on the fundamentalist side. You're on the losing side from the world's perspective. You are on the losing team, but that's not what the Bible says. And, and there is a, a frustration and a tension, and I think it is perhaps even a good thing in some realms because it's showing us who are the Christians. that We don't want cultural Christianity. We want real Christianity. We want people that really live out their faith and like the Bible says, when the Apostle Paul or the Apostle Peter writes, he says, rejoice so far in suffering. You're sharing in Christ's suffering. Rejoice and be glad when this is revealed. For if you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed. Because of the spirit of glory of, and God rests upon you. We're in an interesting time. And we've got to look to the scriptures and lean hard on the Holy Spirit right now in this time. And we can't demonize uh, government and say that's all evil. Um, and we got to be cautious in how we respond. But every single one of us are challenged to share and show the love of Christ and whatever, whatever sphere of influence that we're called to. And let us pray for godly men and women to enter those special callings 
the, 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 the robes of society, to be cultural influencers, even in our universities, I think it's important that we see the idea of intelligent design and other concepts being presented. And not everybody is called to that. And so we can't fight every battle. What we're called to as Christians is to pray, to work for, not to convert an entire country, but to see that Jesus Christ is presented and allow him to convert the citizens of that country. We're after, again, um, seeking the Christian America. We're, we're after ministering and witnessing to Americans not to bring America back in a sense. So I know it's a lot of tension. You may have questions. You want to write me, go ahead and do that. I want to pray for you, and then we're going to continue to worship. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege, the opportunity. I pray that we would look deeper into your word, uh, that we would, Lord, be proud and thankful and pray for those in our uh, government officials and roles and responsibilities. Lord, where there is injustice, help us to intelligently engage. And Lord, we pray for those in power to bring it for the good of humanity and for your glory, God, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey guys, we're gonna continue to worship today. And right now we're gonna enter into our time of communion. And so uh, if you happen to be sitting in, in your homes and you have a piece of bread and some juice to, to have in front of you, if you haven't already gathered that, I would encourage you to do that right now. Communion is one of the ways that we worship God uh, during our services. And it's all about just remembering the goodness of God and remembering uh, his loving act in sending his son Jesus uh, to this earth to live perfectly and without sin, uh, to teach us the way of salvation, and then to pave a way for salvation for us through his death and through his resurrection. And so I'm gonna say a word of prayer for us here in just a moment, but today we invite anyone who is a follower of Jesus Christ who is tuning in today uh, to partake in communion with us. Uh, would you join me in a word of prayer? Father God, we come to you and we thank you so much for sending your son Jesus putting your love on display. Jesus, we thank you for, for being obedient to the Father's will, out of his loving will, his perfect will, and, and, and going to that cross for our sake, dying a sinner's death, though you were without sin. Lord, we thank you for that act of love, that sacrifice, Father. We spend some time in remembrance and worship just, just, just thanking you for what you have done for us. We thank you, Lord. Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen.
Hey, we're going to continue to worship today uh, through singing now. Uh, we have a special guest, Sydney, with us today, and I'm so excited to have her, uh, especially in light of our Better Together series. She comes from another local church here in the Valley, and uh, again, I'm just so excited to have her lead us in worship today. Would you join us and sing this? I love you, Lord.
lot has happened in our world over the last several months, and we just always have to come back to that promise of the goodness of God. We thank you so much for, for worshiping with us today. Uh, thanks again to Sydney for, for joining us and leading us in worship as we've closed out our service. I want to thank you again. Uh, if you're new with us or if you, you want to connect with us in any regard, maybe you've made a decision in your life, uh, maybe you, you need to talk with one of our pastors, we would love for you to let us know. And you can do that by simply texting NV Connect to the number 94090. I want to encourage you this, this coming week, be praying for our leaders, for the leaders of our nation, uh, for our city, uh, for our law enforcement. I want to encourage us all to be in prayer for them. Uh, we're better together. Uh, have a great week of worship, and we will see you next week. God bless.